come to grips with um, as we go through this. This is not just, uh, as somebody said to me, so are we going to have green, green Kool-Aid and cookies? Because I'm not coming if we're not, you know, during the week of vacation Bible school. Well, <clears throat> Don't have any green Kool-Aid or cookies, but we, uh, we do have God's Word, and we do have somebody who can rightly divide it. So, Tim, why don't you come? Let's welcome Tim as he comes and shares with us. Thank you, Lonnie. You know, uh, you, can, you can find just about anything on uh, the computer nowadays, on the Internet, uh, our 11-year-old grandson is in uh, Cub Scouts, had to learn how to tie knots. He was the only one that came back the next week and could tie all the knots. He's a smart kid. I said, how'd you learn that? He said, YouTube. So the other day, we got a message from a friend of ours who's kind of a, he's a funny guy. So he had sent a thing of, of how to learn how to sleep in a chair. Number one, be old. (laughs) Number two, sit in a chair. So what I want to talk to you about is what's going on and what has happened. The last 10 months, I was in an intensive course. Uh, I had assignments every day. I had things to do. It was a 10-month course from the Colson Institute on worldviews and culture. And it just seems like I don't know, maybe it's kind of like when you buy a new car and all of a sudden you see everybody else has got this new car. But it's just really happening everywhere. Uh, I was in two uh, Christian academies in the last month. And in both of them, I went in the first one. The guy said, I'd already spoken there before. and He wasn't being unfriendly. He was just going to kind of give himself some space. He said, I've got something I've got to do in about a half hour. I said, I get it. He said, I'll get right onto it and get out. I left an hour and a half later. As we begin to talk about world cult, world views, and how it was impacting the culture, he said, this year, this school year, in a Christian school, I've had to call parents in because they had a child in the fourth grade who expressed that he was having gender identification problems. This is how it is. And this is the way it's going. So when, when I, uh, I walked into another one, just uh, this was not, that guy was the headmaster. This other guy was in charge of the curriculum for the school at North Point. And uh, he knew what I was coming for. I let him know so I could get an appointment with him and made an appointment when I came in. He had a stack of books about like this on his desk. I said, is that your reading curriculum for the summer? He said, yeah. I said, that looks pretty heavy. And he said, well, we're changing our curriculum this year for our juniors and seniors. I said, how so? He said, we're going to concentrate on worldviews and culture. And I told him I had just finished the Colson Institute. He said, that's why you're here. What books did you all read? I said, I'd have to go back and look at the list. We had to read between 18 and 20 books during the 10-month period. We had studies every day. We had a mentor we met with uh, once a month for about five hours. So it was pretty intensive. Uh, I noticed when I went, when I had an interview with them about taking the course and they looked at my age, which I'm 76, they asked me this question. What are the last five books you've read? I said, well, I'm I'm not sure I could name them without looking. Well, this is going to be intensive reading. I said, well, the reason I'm saying that is that I'm reading more than five books at once. That's just the way I am. And uh, then they said, uh, well, well, let us tell you when you can drop the course and get most of your money back. I said, I'm going the whole way, you know. I am, it's called the Colson Fellows Program. And so, uh, you know, I breezed through college. Uh, That is that I got through easy. I got thrown out real quick. I fought a battle with alcohol for 14 years, and so I was determined that I would be, you know, I've been teaching for 35 years, but this opened my eyes to some things I had not thought about before, and it looks like everybody's coming to the same place. 
This is what I read when I was looking at material because I was looking at two courses, and this is what Chuck Colson wrote, and this is what said I'm signing up. We live in a culture that is at best morally indifferent. A culture in which Judeo-Christian values are not only mocked, but attacked. A culture of, of where Christian values are not only mocked, but attacked. A culture of violence, meanness, and disintegrating personal behavior, destroying civility, and endangering the very life of our communities. He said, we're tempted to withdraw. And then he makes the most brilliant statement because I love people that can use a economy of words because I have trouble with that. He says, but our love of God and our neighbor compels us to act on behalf of humanity in God's will. I realized he just nailed the first and second greatest commandments. And then he said, here's what we're going to do. And here's what I'm going to train you to do. And here's what I want to help you prepare to do for your children and grandchildren. We're going to protect what is good. We're going to oppose what is harmful. We're going to supply what is missing. And we're going to restore what is broken. So we begin to look at this. And this was what my, uh, I had to develop a teaching practicum in your book. Unashamed is what, what I developed. So I just want to, before we get started, because I'm going to invite you to join the ranks of the unashamed. I, I, I came across this in reading one of the many books I had to read. I, I found this story. So if you'll turn to page 40 in your book, this is what I've entitled The Epilogue of the Unashamed. This was a young African man who was martyred for his faith. And when they went and his family went to clean out his room, they found this writing. If you get about halfway into the paragraph there, the part that says, I'm part of the fellowship. Listen to what he had written. I'm part of the fellowship of the unashamed. The die has been cast. I've stepped over the line. The decision has been made. I'm a disciple of Jesus Christ. I won't look back, let up, slow down, back away, or be still. Somebody reading that might think, this guy sounds like a fanatic. Or else he's focused on what is most important. I don't know about y'all, but I imagine just looking out and knowing some of you, you learn one thing in your life, and that's why we have so much wisdom and experience here. We learn to make wise decisions by making a lot of unwise decisions. But here's what we did learn. You won't get anywhere with half-hearted effort. It takes wholehearted effort in whatever you do, whatever you put your hand to. And so he is, he says, I am a disciple. A disciple is not a label, it is a lifestyle. A disciple is a follower of Christ. A disciple is a learner, a continuous learner, and also a teacher. And so he goes on, he says, my past is redeemed, my present makes sense, and my future is secure. I am finished and done with low living, sight walking, smooth knees, colorless dreams, tame visions, worldly talking, cheap giving, and dwarf goals. My pace is set, my gait is fast, my goal is heaven, my road is narrow, my, my way is rough, my companions are few, my guide is reliable, my mission is clear. I won't give up, shut up, or let up until I've stayed up, stored up, and prayed up for the cause of Christ. I must go until he comes, and when he comes for his own, he'll have no trouble recognizing me because my banner will have been clear. Unashamed. Unashamed. How many of you have been living in Jackson for a while, know Earl Tapley? Knew Earl Tapley. Earl Tapley is one of my heroes. Earl Tapley was a street missionary. He was, a street, he, was a, he was actually an ordained Baptist minister who never had a church. He planted churches. He witnessed every spare moment he had. One day, he was friends with our pastor. I was going to Woodland Baptist Church. He came in, and I used to talk to him at Kroger when he would be sitting on a, a, a little stool with a box of cold water in his tracks. And uh, he came in that day, and he handed me a book that he had written 
that his son, who was a doctor, had helped him self-publish. You know what the title of it? Because the title recognized was what his goal in life was. His goal in life was to see through his ministry one million souls saved for Jesus. A simple man worked in a factory. He was a member of the Madison Chester County Baptist Association. Brother Bob Irvin, who was my good friend and pastor, said some week, some months when we met, Earl had had more conversions than most of the churches had. He was having an impact. And so here we are. I can't put everybody in my age group. I'm 76 years old. But what I know is my group grew up in the last half of the 20th century. We impacted the last half of the 20th century in our sheer numbers of, of, of a birth and then went through the society and culture, as they say, like a pig to a python. This century, we will impact the first half of this century in a different way by our passing away. And so what we're going to leave, and it has to be planned and it has to be intentional, is an inheritance, which is something left for somebody. It is where you leave property, uh, monies, uh, heirlooms for your heirs in a legal document, a last will and testament. And we also want to leave a legacy. A legacy is something you leave in somebody, something that people can say that they can say, this is what our children call, our grandchildren call Jenna Jinjin. This is what Jinjin taught me. This is what Pops taught me. We had our six-year-old granddaughter over, and uh, somehow the conversation at lunch turned to, if you could have anything, what would you want? And then what would you give to Pops? And she thought for a minute, she said, I'd give Pops all the Bibles I could find. She said, I said, what would you leave Jinji in? <laughs> she said, I'd leave Jinji in all the earrings you can find. <laughs> and then our son Ben was there. She, I said, what would you leave Uncle Ben? And she thought, because he's a reader, she said, I would leave him all the books I could find. A legacy is something you leave. And, and Jenna's Aunt Juicy used to say, little pictures have big ears. A little girl was following her daddy out of church one day. And her daddy always stopped at the pastor and shook his hands and uh, had a small conversation and moved on. So she came up and shook hands with the pastor and put a quarter in his hand. And he said, hey, did you forget to put that in the collection page? She said, no, that's for you. He said, well, that's sweet of you. She said, and when I get, grow up and I'm married and rich, so I'm going to give you a lot of money. He said, well, why do you want to do that? She said, because my daddy said, you're the poorest preacher we've ever had. <laughs> so you have to be careful, children, listen to what they say and what you do. So growing up in the 50s, the 50s was the pinnacle of the 20th century. Now, when you look at the Bible and you look at leaving legacies, what you realize is our parents and grandparents were the greatest generation of the 20th century. Through a depression, through wars, uh, they learned to sacrifice, they learned to be content, they learned to share even when they didn't have much, and they were disciplined. And so what we see is we, we, we were taught differently in school. School was different. By the time I was through the sixth grade, I had read every biography of every president in our library. They were heroes. They were heroes. I found something I liked about each one of them, especially Teddy Roosevelt, because my daddy pointed out to him, my father was an optometrist, he said, Teddy Roosevelt was nearsighted like you, Tim, and he had asthma like you, and look what he came. That's actually sprinkling a little salt, isn't it? We live in a dark and perverse generation, and things just continue to get worse. We, uh, our school, we, we had civics, we had history. When I talk about reading in the fifth and sixth grade, I can't remember which one which, but our teacher read to us one year, Count of Monte Cristo and another Treasure Island. And I remember when we were reading Treasure Island, we got down to about two chapters left. She read for a half hour after lunch, and we asked her to please finish it. She said, I can't, we have to do our regular courses. 
We said, isn't there any way? She said, if you'll give up your recess, I will finish the book for you. Has to be 100% of it. All of us wanted her to finish Treasure Island. I remember when she finished it, the thought I had was, I wish we hadn't hurried through it. I wish it wasn't over. These are things we were taught back then. We had to memorize things. We studied civics. We learned how our government worked. We studied history. And we have a profound disconnect from our history. When Moses got ready to lead the children who had been wandering in the wilderness for 40 years into the promised land, he knew he wasn't going to get to go with them. So what he did, well, the first thing he did was he taught them the history of Israel, that they were God's people. When Joshua died, before he died, all the people followed. He died at 110. All the people of, follow, of Israel followed Joshua. And then when he died, the elder generation that served with him, they followed them. We are fast becoming, if we aren't already, the elder generation. And when the elder generation passed away, you know what it says in Judges 2. There rose a generation that did not know the Lord of Israel and what he had done for them. That is where we are today. We remember Eisenhower was our president. Can you imagine both the Democratic Party and the Republic Party pursued Eisenhower for their nominee? Both of them recognized a man of integrity, character, who was a natural leader. When he was elected, he was elected when I was in the second grade. He was president until I was through the 10th grade. It was like I grew up with him. His name, Dwight David Eisenhower, his parents were Mennonites, named him after the greatest evangelist of the 19th century, Dwight L. Moody. He went into the, uh, West Point at age 18, but what you see is Billy Graham caught up with him when he was over for a NATO meeting in Europe, and he said, you have to run for president. He said, which office, which uh, party should I run for? He said, it doesn't make any difference. You just need to be president. What else did he do? He started the National Day of Prayer. He, he changed by law our Pledge of Allegiance and put one nation under God. He built Interstate 40. But he did something else. On the 10th day that he was in office as President of the United States, he did something that had never been done before or since. He got baptized. I think if a president got baptized in office today, there would be grounds for impeachment brought up. We're that far off. And so what we see is... We memorized things. We memorized historical documents that were important. This is so relative. We memorized the beginning of the Gettysburg Address. I bet a lot of you know how it starts. Four score and seven years ago, our forefathers brought forth on this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty and dedicated to the purpose that all men are created equal. Now we're engaged in a great civil war to determine if such a nation so conceived can endure. And that is where we are. We are in a revolution. We're in a revolution. Let me tell you how revolutions start and have ever since there have been revolutions. Revolutions start in a moment of culture. And they take that moment and they come with an ideology which is actually a pretext that covers what they really want to accomplish. And that is how revolutions start. And a revolution has to have those people, it has to have those people who will carry forth the message, their ideology. They're like uh, evangelists for them. They have an ideology that supersedes all other ideologies and they must sub everyone must submit to it. If they do not submit to it, they will be shamed, they will be bullied, they'll get you fired from your job, They'll even, there is even act on violence. And so when you have a revolution, you always have chaos. And that is by design. They do not, they want, they do not want to solve the problem they're talking about. They want to use it. And this is done, and this is being done now. So what we need to do is look at what, what we can we do. Because one of the poems we memorized, and this was a short one, but one that I think also fits where we are today. Maybe you remember this. This poem was written by Edna Wheeler Wilcox, and it was back in the times when the ships that sailed the oceans 
sail by the wind only. And she said this, one ship drives to the east and one ship drives to the west with the self-same winds that blow. It's the set of the sails and not the gales that determine the direction we go. We have to teach our children, our grandchildren, and whoever's in our sphere of influence how to set their sails in the will of God in the most anti-Christian culture we've had in the history of America. They are rewriting history, you know that. One of the books that is, they've rewritten is 1619, where they state America was built by slaves. Slavery is a part of our history, it is a dark stain. And 80 years after we wrote our Constitution in 1783, we fought a war to abolish slavery. And we've tried ever since. Every country makes mistakes. Every person makes mistakes. When James Madison, the architect of the uh, Constitution, was asked, how could they do that? He had one simple answer. He said, we're not angels. We're not angels. All have sinned to come short of the glory of God. And so what we see is, is this is what has happened, and this is where we are. So let me share with you what are five troubling trends. And you'll recognize these immediately. You may not agree with how people are defining them. You may not agree with what their solutions are, but I think you will agree they're a problem. And these five problems, and they're just like reading the newspaper or listening to the news. First of all, we have an economic decline. See if this doesn't make sense to you. I haven't seen anybody that I've talked to that I told this to that didn't react almost with shock. I said, if you want to know why we're having an economic decline, I could talk to you about the percentage of our budget to our gross domestic product, but let me put it in simple terms. Somehow, we have come to a point where there doesn't seem to be that much difference between a million, a billion, and a trillion. But I'm going to show you just how much difference there is. If you had a business, a purely profit-driven business, that, would make, that could create one dollar of pure profit, that's after all expenses, insurance, everything, one dollar profit every second, 60 seconds a minute, 24, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, how long do you think it would take for you to accumulate a million dollars? You'd have it on the 12th day. I wish I had one sitting in my kitchen. Instead, I got one that's burning it. A billion. It can't be that much difference between a million and a billion. It took 12 days to get the million. How long would it take to get the billion using the same statistics? Over 30 years. That's a dollar every second. How about a trillion? Over 30,000 years. We owe $30 trillion. I don't know who we owe it to. I don't know how they're going to pay it. At the current interest rate, it's $1.1 billion a day just to pay the interest. And so we have an economic decline. We have a moral decline. The church, the church was not ready for what has happened in the last three years. And what you see is the, the, the cultural moment came in 2020. The cultural moment that started the revolution started in 2020. Watch what happened. Watch all the things that had taken place that made it the perfect cultural moment. You had to have the internet get to where it is. You had to have phones get to where they were. 2008 is when you got this smartphone. You had to have people able to access this to take photos and videos and send them out. So what happens? A horrible, evil, burned out policeman was caught on video in Minneapolis, in Minnesota, with his knee on a black man's life and just squeezed the life out of him in 11 minutes. It was horrible. And so obviously it created great fury and great concern. So the pretext is the black lives say police are riding around their cars shooting us and killing us. They made what was the exception and it was horrific. This was an evil man. It made what was the exception the norm. 
So what you're going to see is this. Charles Coulson calls it, it's called after him the Coulson Law. And what you see is, it's called the four C's. You have community. Some of you probably know this. Community. The way I like to look at it is a common unity. That is, people come together for a good purpose. Now, what we have to do is we have to go back and look at creation to see what it is is that God wants to do. When you go back and look at creation, remember the Bible is a story. Story is the language of the heart. It is a narrative story that it has mostly story, it has poems, it has law, it has principles, it has promises, but it has stories. You start out and you have the story and you have the plot. And everybody knows what the, what the, the plot of the Bible is. You have creation. Creation, God creates a place, a people. He gives them a purpose and a plan. And when you come to, in fact, the first chapter of Genesis is one of the most debated, debated chapters in the Bible. The reason why is there are 31 verses in the first chapter of Genesis, and God's name is mentioned 32 times. It is the most God-centered chapter in the whole Bible. And so he created man, and he tells us in chapter 2 the reason he created them and how he created them. He created them male and female. He created them to be married. Marriage was the first institution that God made. And his son said, what God has put together, let no man put us under. But we did in 2015. We did it in 2015. We legalized same-sex marriage. And of course, the younger generations thinks we're crazy to be about that, but they don't understand how important this is. This is what God intended as the building block of society, culture, and the population. People who were created in his image, in his likeness, who were married for life, who produced children, <coughs> and those children were to be taught in a home that was filled with love where parents and grandparents would teach them how they to live life according to the way God meant it to be. And that was what was going to be the building block. And that was what we're going to build. The, 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 the culture was going to be built on that. So what we see is God wanted a community. We would call it, some of you have the sign, the shirt, a gospel community. And so what happened when God created the heavens and the earth and then he created everything for man and put them there and he gave them their purpose. They were, it was almost like uh, the Great Commission. You are under my authority, you're to rule and reign with me and you're over all of the, all of the earth. And you will then be uh, to create after your own self, and they will populate the earth. And then comes the fall. And you wonder, how could they do that? What I wonder is, how in the world could Lucifer do what he did? But you see, you can probably identify with Lucifer maybe even scary easier than you think you can. You see what Lucifer wanted to do? Lucifer wanted to decide for himself what was right or wrong. He wanted to be his own God, which is what we do every time we sin. We decide we want to be our own God. We want to decide right from wrong ourselves. Don't take God's word for it, and that's what the enemy attacked. And that's what he's been attacking ever since. You had the fall, then you had the redemption, where God had a plan. What I like about what I see about God that very first time, when they sinned and he came to the garden and they weren't there, he called out and said, where are you, Adam? He knew where he was. He wanted Adam to look where he was. You remember what Adam told him? Adam said, we heard your voice in the garden and we were afraid because we were... Have you ever noticed southern people cannot say naked? <laughs> it's the only way we know how to say it in the south is Adam and Eve were naked. And they had tried to cover themselves. He knew where they was. Watch him connect the dots. Who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I told you not to eat from? And so we see the first sin. And so what has happened to their community? It's lost. 
And then, of course, from redemption, you go into restoration, which all things are being made new in the end, but when you get saved, old things are passing away and things are becoming new. So here's what we see. It's been the same ever since. The community wants to integrate people, and the opposite of that and what is against it is what the people who want to tear down that and why does the enemy want to tear down that? Because families are the backbone of everything. They're the backbone of our culture. They're the backbone of this nature. They're the building block of it. And so what he wants to do is destroy the family because strong families make strong communities. You see the communities where all the crime is in Chicago, guess what? There's no fathers in the house. There is no semblance of that at all in all of these neighborhoods that you find like that. When people come together in a community and you're in a HOA, a homeowners association, what is their goal? To look after each other. What did, what did Chuck Colson catch there so easy? He said, here are the two things you gotta do. You gotta, for the love of God and the love of your neighbors. If you live in a good neighborhood, you know you have a neighborhood that you can trust your neighbors that take care of their property, that look after you, that if you're sick, they'll visit you. If there's death like we had in our neighborhood, all of a sudden, that man whose wife died, everybody in the neighborhood has reached out to him. I've never seen such a change in a man. He stops every morning now to talk to me. He can't hear, and neither can I, but we at least talk to each other, or try to. And so, what you see is, there is chaos. Now, what you have, these, this is, positive and this is negative. This is the offense, this is, this is the defense for the community, is a strong family, and this is the offense, let's destroy the family. So what we need, and the, our founding fathers knew this, is we need two shields. We need an outer shield, which is the law, which we'll use the four C's, or the cops. And we need an inner shield, which is your conscience. And it has to be a conscience that has been conditioned and transformed by the Word of God. And here's the way it works. If the conscience is well developed from the Word of God and can discern right from wrong, then you'll have a strong community and you probably won't need as many policemen. But if the conscience is seared, if there are people who say there is no God, guess what? They have no reason to say no to anything. When you believe there's no God, you can make up your own rules, you're your own God, and you don't have to say no to anything that you want to do. And that's where we are in self-autonomy. So when the conscience goes down, the police go up, and what they're then afraid of is if they can create chaos with the outer shield, then they can, they can really take the community down. Does that make sense to you? Do you understand that? You see that happening, and you see in the last three years what's happened. Now, here's the problem. You have a, you have a moral decline, so this is why we're having problems in the neighborhoods. You're having an educational breakdown. These are these five troubling trends. Uh, economic decline. How does an e economic decline affect the family? One of the things that husbands and wives argue over more than anything besides SEX is money. Then you have uh, educational breakdown. What happens to the kids? These kids in the last two or three years probably all are going to need counseling because their life has been turned upside down. I went and spoke to 14 and 15 year olds in a Christian academy. I took them through my life and the mistakes I made and told, warned them about it. And then I led them in a sinner's prayer not knowing what to expect. And the teacher said, they'll send you a thank you note. Two weeks later, I got the thank you notes. If I'm ever having a bad day, all I have to do is go back and read those thank you notes. I had three teenage girls that asked the Lord Jesus to come into their life. I had another young girl, a Hispanic, who said, I'm in a dark place like you talked about, Mr. Fortin, and I'm hurting myself, and we got her help. And I had another one, who I know just that type, who didn't sign his name, he signed it anonymous, but he said, I have the same problem as you had, and I'm trying to work my way through them. They're having, you think it's been confusing for us the last two or three years? Imagine that you're a teenager, if that isn't confusing enough, 
and what they're going through in their world is upside down and they don't know what the future is going to be. And so then we see radical legal rulings, which may be changing, I don't know. But what you see is wherever community shrinks back, law steps in and government does. They want to control as many areas of your life as they can. And I know we're talking now about socialism, but I'm just going to confess this, and you don't have to nod your head if you did the same thing. When, they, when the government sent me a check that I didn't work for, I kept it. I spent it. And what you see is they're taking advantage of a, social, a cultural moment, and that's what they've always done. Saul Alinsky, who is uh, the one they consider the godfather of community organizing, who has impressed a lot of political people. He said, you never want to solve a problem, you want to use it. And so we see then the last of those five that I would list, you've got an economic decline, a moral decline, an educational breakdown, a radical legal rulings, and then the slaughter of innocents, the abortion debate. The abortion debate. And I know that this is uh, very controversial, and I'm not trying to be political. I'm trying to paint you a picture of what our grandchildren and children face. When I get to the part where we look at the flashpoints, you'll see the first four flashpoints that they identified, these smart people who did a lot of study, are all sexual. And pornography is at the top of their list. I told, I told our daughter, because we have 11-year-old twins, I said, for as long as you can, keep a smartphone out of their hands. You see, the enemy has been working on all of this for years, for centuries, to get the tools that he needs. The flip phone, they're not going to make a traditional flip phone anymore. The flip phone, they're going to make one, but it's going to have a screen and smartphone technology. So <clears throat> when they go into pornography, and it's not a matter if your preteen has seen pornography, they've seen it, because it is not them looking for it, it comes looking for them. You can put in a completely innocent word, or what seems to be an innocent word, and it'll pop on the screen. And when it does, what you have to realize is this. The eyes are the lamp of the soul. It's the only place that light comes in. And when it comes in, it brings information. Light travels at 186,240 miles per second. Just went around the Earth seven and a half times. When it comes into your eyes, which are miraculous, two million moving parts in each one, it takes that and changes the speed the amount, the direction, and then on the back of the retina in a place called the fovea, it converts the information light is brought in into electrical chemical impulses, and there it is on the screen of their mind. They're looking at something they've never seen before, and it can burn right through. And people who look at that will have trouble with their sex life, with their marriage, because it is so addictive. It is so addictive, they now tell us that it can actually change your brain the way anything addictive does. You have four, uh, you have five cultural institutions under attack. They are changing society. And again, all the things were in place for them to take advantage of the cultural moment to create something called social media. Facebook, all the other things. <clears throat> what you have is, uh, you can go out to eat sometimes now that we're getting to go back out to eat, and you can see a family that maybe there's two teenagers and mom and dad sitting out having dinner out. And guess what? They all four have their iPhones out. Mom and dad are kind of coordinating, and brother and sister or two boys are goofing off and doing this, that, and the other. You know what they are? They're alone together. They're alone together. What does God want? He wants a community of like-minded people. He wants a community that stands for something, that holds for something, that wants something to do. Politics, politics are a lagging indicator. I love that song by Luke Garrett. It's still the cross. He said, it's not conservative or liberal, however they're defined. 
It's not about interpretations or judgments of the mind. It's the opposite of politics, power, and prestige. It's about a simple message, and do you believe? It's still the gospel. It's still the blood of Christ that cleanses us from sin. That's why I'm unashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of God unto salvation to all who believe. And so we see politics, we see education is another cultural, and you see what's happened. They're not, they're rewriting history. They're vilifying our heroes. Uh, Jenna's daddy volunteered for the Army Air Corps when he was 17 years old in 1942 when the war had started. When you have a chance, when we break and you go over there, uh, there's a couple of books that we have that, 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 are, that are for sale, but you'll see something called, uh, because when we grew up in the 50s, we grew up in the Norman Rockwell decade. And that is four covers that appeared in the spring of 1943, uh, consecutive weeks. And when you look at the first one on the left, you'll see a young man, real earnest, he's a blue collar worker. He's at a town meeting and he's getting to speak. And the freedom he's, he is uh, representing is freedom of speech. The next you see people in, in, in prayer and that's the freedom of religion. The third one is one that will look more familiar to you because Hallmark took that picture and made it a uh, Thanksgiving card. It's a family eating Thanksgiving turkey. Guess what it is a freedom of? Freedom from want. Because these people, that, these four freedoms came from FDR's uh, State of the Union speech in uh, uh, January the 6th, 1941. They weren't in war yet. They were 335 days away from it. But England had been being bombed for the whole year of 1941. Then you have the last one, which you really, with Norman Rockwell, you had to look for the clues. Here's the husband, the mother's tucking in what looks like twins. They've got her red hair. He's got gray around the temple, so you know he's not of an age to be drafted. But it's the paper that tells the story. It's folded. So the first one says, bombs K, and then the fold comes. Hara H, and you can imagine what it is. What are those people doing? They are thanking God for freedom from fear that they aren't being bombed by somebody every single night and having to spend the night in a bomb shelter like they were in England. When I looked at that, I thought, here we are 81 years later. What's important? Freedom of speech. Freedom of religion. Freedom from want. We're going to have some want this summer. We're already having some want. And there are going to be some areas where they're going to have droughts and famine and starvation. And people want to know, we want to live in a country where we can have the ability to put food on the table. And everybody wants freedom from fear. So what do we do? I don't want to tell you all these problems and then how to have a solution. And that's what this whole thing was about. Protect what is good. How can you protect what is good if you don't know what is good? How can you protect what is good if you don't believe in absolute truth and absolute morality, but in relative truth and relative morality? You can't. People have got a lot of questions, and you need to know something about science. So let's, let's think about how this country started out. If you'll turn in your book to page one, well, actually go past page one, that's forward. It's on page two, The Great Awakening. What you'll discover is something about the history of America. And like Moses, I think we need to let people know what we used to be. And that's what Moses wanted them to know. He wanted to know, you're God's people. Don't lose your identity. Don't let that thief, don't let that one who is the father of lies, who is a thief, kill and steal and destroy. Don't let him take your identity as a Christian. So one of the books that came out that were rewriting, and I think they've actually kind of sidelined that to, to, to address some issues, and, and this is not anti anybody or that, but what, when they look and talk about in 1619, America was being built by slaves. We had slaves, that's true, but America did not exist in 1619. You had 13 British colonies that ran from Maine down to Georgia, 1,400 miles. They were under the rule of, of, uh, of the uh, British law, which was a slave-owning nation. 
And those who are in the agriculture, they were encouraged to have that. Doesn't make it right, it's wrong, wrong as can be. And so what you saw was you had 13 colonies that really because of distance and how hard it was to travel, really did not have anything in common except they were owned by the British government, which they had not that good of feelings about. But what happened is, in 1739, was the start of what they call the Great Revival. There are four, this is in this first, and this is where you can make history interesting to your children and grandchildren. Because what you want to do is you're going to be salt and light, it's no long lectures, but to just sprinkle some salt when the opportunity arises. I'll give you an example. In fact, our book, uh, People Get Ready, is a devotional book based on the music of our era. I used to bring music into my lessons, uh, titles and songs and things that, that we could connect with. And this was uh, a, actually a devotional, I think it's on I Want to Hold Your Hand, a Beatles song. And I had two stories in there. I want to have stories in there for all of my grandchildren of things that actually happened. And there was a story in there about Jack, our grandson. And there was a story about Virginia. Some of my friends have heard this story before. But we were over at their house, and this is how you sprinkle salt. We were, we were babysitting because their parents had gone somewhere, so we were staying with them. So we're having lunch, and we get ready to have the sandwich headed up to the mouth, and Virginia says to her grandmother, Jin Jin, you forgot to say the blessing. She said, you're right, Virginia. We put the sandwich down. We said the blessing. We get ready to eat again. Out of the mouths of babes. She says, Jin Jin, do you only pray at meals and bedtime? She said, no, Virginia. You can pray to the Lord Jesus anytime you want. And when you pray to Jesus in heaven, here's what he does. He turns to the angels and says, shh, Virginia wants to talk to me. Now, here's what I see, because I've written it down. I'm going to leave it behind. Is someday she will be a 60-year-old grandmother reading that to her 10-year-old granddaughter and said, that is what Jin Jin taught me about prayer. Don't miss those opportunities. And that is what Moses tells him in Deuteronomy 6. You've got to take advantage of those. And so you have to protect what is good means you have to know what is good. And that discernment, you have to have discernment. And discernment comes from study and meditation of the Word of God. Discernment says, I know right from wrong. Plus the Word of God is going to sharpen your conscience. Second thing you want to do is you want to oppose what is harmful. When people call evil good and good evil, we cannot stay silent. We're going to have to speak up. So that means we're also going to have to have courage. We have to supply what is missing. What is missing is the truth. There's only one source of it. Our problem is sin. The answer and solution is salvation. The resource is the gospel. It's the power of God and salvation. We want to supply what is missing. We want to restore what is broken, which is relationships. And that relationship starts with a relationship with Almighty God. As you go through this, and, and I'll just highlight a, a couple of more places, then we'll take a break here in a couple of minutes. When we come to our forgotten history on page four, this is another story for you. And I like to bring in what I call facts that fascinate, something that gets their attention. They spent uh, almost all the summer of 1783 in Philadelphia working on the Constitution. James Madison was the author of the Constitution. He will tell you, and these things are written in the Library of Congress in Washington, where he got the idea for the three systems. In, in Isaiah 33, he comes to a verse that said, the, law, the Lord is our lawgiver, he is our judge, and our king. He said that'll be our three branches, legislative, judicial, and executive. And so when they came out that day, after all summer, they all came out, and a lady asked Benjamin Franklin a question. And another delegate went home that night and recorded in his diary for us to know this, this, his, what he said. She said, what have you given us, Dr. Franklin? A monarchy or a republic? He said, a republic, madam. He took another step and turned around and said, if you can keep it. 
You know what you have to do to keep a republic a self-governing thing? You have to have a community that has a conscience that has been guided by the word of God that will obey the law and will do what they can and organize against chaos. And so this is what we see. Our founding fathers were all part of that. Now, the Constitution that they wrote that summer was 4,200 words. Now, they wrote it handwritten on large sheets of paper, which included their signatures. If you took that and put it in size 12 font and double-spaced, it would be 16 pages. Our Constitution that we've now had, that was 230, what, two or three years ago, however long it was, almost 250 years. The Build Back Better bill was over 2,000 pages and over 500,000 words. And we have run our nation on this. And of course now there is those who want to do away with it. So this book is written for you to write your story in. There's not a one of us who haven't lost a parent or a grandparent that we wished we had asked more questions. And sometimes we didn't even think to ask those questions even when we knew they were going to die. And then we come up and say, I wonder why they did this or how they did that or what happened there. And so you want to write something. You want to leave something behind you. Psalm 102 verse 18 says, this will be written so that those not yet created can read it and praise the Lord. We have to tell them. You can put your testimony in there. You can tell them about pivotal points in your life. In the very back, I've got what they call the flashpoints of this culture that they've identified. And they've identified eight of them. And it starts with four in a row that are right, and that's on about page. Uh, page 75. Page 75, the list. Pornography, the hookup culture, that is casual sex, sexual identification or orientation. Then you've got gender identity. Then you've got affluence and consumerism. We're a country that's driven 70%, our gross domestic product is 70% consumer spending. And you wonder why inflation is number one on concerns? It's because of we're consumer spending. I don't want to look in any direction, okay? But in America, shopping is kind of a hobby. People go shopping because not because they need something. What we're discovering is we go shopping now and find empty shelves that maybe we're realizing we have empty selves. And what we see is, you know, it, it's funny, but our daughter always tells me and my mother, hydrate and keep moving. Sitting now is the new smoking. But what it tells you is you need to get up at least every five minutes and walk around because your blood pools. And this way, when you're walking, you're moving it, and you're getting oxygen to different parts of your body. And so what we see is the book, I think you'll find, reads pretty easy. Uh, I'm going to take a break now for about, what, 10 minutes. You can come look at the picture in the books if you want to. Uh, go out to anything you need to. And let's get back about 1.30. We'll do, have just maybe about 15 more minutes, and then tomorrow we can finish up probably even shorter than that. So thanks for your attention. And well, let's get started, and I'll try to finish this up here with a few minutes, and then we'll finish the rest of it tomorrow. So some of the things you want to do is bring up some history to your kids, grandkids, uh, tell them some of these interesting stories. One of my favorite stories, uh, let me find it for you, is uh, page 8, The Crisis in 1776.
Now, we know that uh, America declared their independence from Great Britain on July the 4th, 1776. And when they did this, uh, of course, there was a lot of hurrahs and cheers, but there were also some people who weren't so sure they wanted to break away. But what happened is uh, they did that in July. What you may not know is in August of that year, 200 tall masted ships from the greatest navy in the world, the British Navy, sailed into the ports at Manhattan. And in August, America lost New York City, their biggest and largest city. By November, they hadn't won a single fight. By December, they were getting cold weather, and the volunteers were going home in droves. They were running out of everything. Men were dying more of dysentery and cold, snowy weather than they were of being in battle. So George Washington, being the man that he was, and the general and military man, knew that if he did not, something didn't happen, he was going to be in big trouble because all he had left were enlisted soldiers, and January the 1, their enlistment ran out. So he called on someone who had visited them before, and this is on page 8, and I know you've heard this story before. The author of it is Thomas Paine. The title of the pamphlet he sent on December the 19th, 1776, was called, uh, These Are the Times That Try Men's Soul, and that's how it starts out. These are the times that try men's souls. The summer soldier and the sunshine patriot will in this crisis shrink back from the services of country. But he that stands it now deserves the love and thanks of man and woman. Tyranny like hell is not easily conquered, yet we have this consolation, consolation with us. The harder the conflict, the more glorious the triumph. For what we obtain too cheaply, we esteem too lightly, for it is dearness that gives everything its value. Do you realize what it costs for God to forgive you of your sins? It not only cost him the son of his life, remember that they're one and the same. He is the one who had to punish him for our sins. His back was striped for our iniquities. Those, those Spikes that were driven in his wrist, that was driven in his feet, were driven by our sins. And so what you see when it says it's dearness, it adds value. What you realize is our parents and grandparents, what they went through to give us what they gave us, an economy that was the best in the world and still is, although it's limping a bit, a country where in the United States in the 1950s, seven out of 10 people went to church on a regular basis. I grew up in Trenton, Tennessee. There was nothing open on Sunday but Page's Barbecue and the Rebel Cafe. Everything else was closed except the hospital. That used to be us. We had people, when somebody got in trouble in a town of 4,500, there were people there for them. There was a family in our church that uh, their father was diagnosed with a brain tumor. This is in the 1950s. And I can remember after his surgery, he came to church and you could see the crisscross of scars on his head and I was just a little boy and it scared me. He had a son who was one year younger than me. He had a, they had a daughter that was the same age as my little sister. In fact, my mother and uh, Melba, the, the, the mother of these two children and the wife of Harold, uh, they were in the hospital together at Humboldt when they delivered their children. My sister was born on Mother's Day, May the 8th, 1949. They were in the hospital together for a week. You got to stay a week back then, ladies, in the hospital when you had a baby. So they were friends. So everybody was praying, and then Harold died in the fall. And the deacons came to her and said, what can we do? And she said, we were expecting this, so we have laid away Christmas gifts for the kids. They said, tell us where they are, what you owe, we'll go get them and bring them to them when you need them. She said, thank you. Where he worked, they came to the managers after he died and said, we would like for you to take out of each one of our checks enough to make up Harold's full check every week. They said, for how long? They said, for at least the next year, but longer if we need to. 
And then the businessman in town came to Melba and said, what would you like to do? She said, I'm just a mother, a housewife, and I've got to go to work, but said, I'm just a high school graduate. They said, how about if we pay your tuition and everything else you need for you to go to West Tennessee Business College and get skills of that? And she did. Guess what they did? They gave her Harold's job, her husband's job, at the workplace. That used to be us. A gospel community who loved the Lord our God and our neighbors. We cared about them. We prayed for them. We may not always like them, but they were, it was a different America. I miss it. But, and it may not be back. Francis Schaeffer, who saw the 50s, and where we were a nation that was more spiritual than we'd been in quite some time. And then saw the 60s. See, I was a child of the 50s. I came of age in the 60s. Sex, drugs, and rock and roll. That was the mantra. We saw a president assassinated, his brother assassinated, Martin Luther King assassinated, a war, and riots on the street. We saw communities being burned down. We saw people being divided. And when you see these things on television, when you watch news, just like Jenna always asks me, why are these stupid people doing this? I say, you don't think it's by accident, do you? This is a plan. It is a strategy, and it's what they're carrying out. And what they've already said is, we do not believe this community is fair, and we're going to start over. And what we see is, this is what you must remember. This is exactly what Jesus said. You do not return evil for evil. You return good for evil. I'll close with one story and we'll finish up and look at some more things in the book tomorrow. This was a man that I got to know, not in person yet, but I feel like in person because I've read, he was part of my reading material. His name is John Stone Street. Some of you may recognize that name. And uh, when uh, uh, he told this story, it was in one of his books. He said when he was in the ninth grade, he went to a Christian school. He said when he was in the ninth grade, when he woke up in the morning, he said he had two things on his mind 99% of the time, and they would rotate in order. Sometimes this would be number one and this would be number two. He said, but the two things were on my mind when I woke up when I was a ninth graded knucklehead going to Christian school was basketball and girls, or girls and basketball. He said, so it's the last day before Christmas break. Our headmaster, who's also our associate pastor, has this great idea, he thinks. We're going to visit shut-ins. He paired me with a boy named Nathan because Nathan had his driver's license and I was only 14. He says, you're going to see these two widows who are shut-ins. And so we got in the car, and I looked at Nathan, and Nathan looked at me, and he said, this is exactly what I said to him. Is this not the stupidest idea you've ever heard? What are we, a 14 and a 16-year-old, going to do with these two old women? And the guy said, you're right. So he took one of the addresses and threw it out the window said, we'll tell them we lost one of the addresses. We'll go see this one, make it quick, then we can go to the mall because the girls are going to be shopping. So they go. It's a pretty long drive out in the country. The lady's name is Omega Buckner. She is 87 years old. They get there, and she's living with her grandson, who's built a little apartment for her. They knock on the door. She comes. She's expecting to go in. He says, we have small talk, and said, it's very small. Then she suggests we sing a Christmas carol. And so we're singing Silent Night, and she goes on into the second verse, which we don't know what it is anyway. And she says, okay, let's pray. And John said, I then actually lied to her. I said, yes, we've got to see, get to see this other person. He said, my buddy prayed, I prayed. Said it probably took 45 seconds. Said then she prayed. She didn't pray loud. She didn't pray long. But I had to look up once to see if Jesus was sitting next to her. 
said she talked like she knew him personally and he was right there and could listen and hear her. He said, we left, so we went out. Nathan made this comment. He said, I remember it. He said, hey, she's a pretty cool old, cool old woman once. I said, yeah, she's all right. He said, never had another thought of her till I was a junior in high school and now I played varsity basketball and I had a regular girlfriend who had a driver's license but said that morning when I woke up, they weren't on my mind. Omega Buckner was on my mind. Why in the world is she on my mind? I told my girlfriend, you have to drive me out to see this lady. She said, why? He said, I don't know. She said, dumb. Got out there, she said, I'm not going in. He knocked on the door. Omega Buckner came there. Hadn't seen him in two years. He said, Miss Buckner, you may not remember me. I'm John Stone Street. I was here too. She said, I prayed for you this morning, John. I prayed for you this morning. He said, that began a friendship. He said, I will never know this side of heaven how many things she prayed me into and out of a gospel community. Prays for one another. He consulted her and had her praying about everything. He said for the next six years that she was alive, she prayed for him every single day and told him she had prayed for him every single day since the first time he came out there. She did that. That's why the pastor sent her to them. Here's a shut-in. She can't even get to the church. Let me tell you about John Stone Street. He went on. He went to seminary. He went to, uh, to the mission field. He came back and did an uh, internship at that church, and he was only there for six months, but he said, I took group after group to visit Omega Buckner. He said, it was the most rewarding friendship that had the greatest impact on my life of anybody I can think of. The power of prayer. John Stone Street took over from Chuck Colson, the Colson Institute. He is the voice of Breakpoint that each morning, eight million people listen to. A knucklehead ninth grader who went to Christian school and said, isn't this the dumbest idea you ever heard of? God is at work. And you may be thinking, I can't do this or I can't do that, but I know what you can do. You can pray. Her. And I'm going to tell you what I'm going to ask you to do, to pray for me because I want to take this message to people our age to let them know you are part of a community. You are part of a kingdom. And here's the question you have to ask for yourself that you have to answer for yourself. Jesus asked the disciples one day, he says, Who's everybody saying I am? So I said, well, some think you're John the Baptist coming to life. Some think you're Elijah. Some think you're Jeremiah, one of the other prophets. Here's the question I want you to ask and answer yourself. Jesus says, who do you think I am? Simon Peter got it right for once. He said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. He said, you got something right, Peter. Flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you. My Father in heaven did. And upon this stone, I will build the church, my church, his body. And so when I say we are family, we are a church family. We are brothers and sisters. We have genealogical families. And what we have is we live in communities. And what we don't want is we don't want to be afraid. We don't want to be afraid to knock on their door and tell them about Jesus Christ. For all you know, there's somebody waiting for you like Omega Buckner who's waiting for you to say, I've been praying somebody would come here that I could tell about Jesus. This is what we can do. We can protect what is good. We can oppose what is harmful. We can supply what is missing. And we can restore what is broken. And when the Lord brings you to those situations and even those where you just see you realize when you see something on television that is horrific that you can begin to pray right then for what's happening. And, and you know, John Stone Street was, you know, just woke up. Why did he wake up? 
Why did I come in off a balcony that I was going to jump off of when I was 31 years old because I couldn't get sober? I'll tell you why. Those of you who have children in here and have grandchildren in here, how many times do you pray for them a day? Every day. In the 14 years that I was, see, the thing about a prodigal, a prodigal gets all the prayers in the family. That's the one good thing about it. And, and, and a prodigal, my mother had her friends, and she was a Bible teacher too. She had her friends praying for me. She had her grandmother. My grandmother was a church woman. She had her friends praying for me. When I came in off of that balcony, what brought me in off of that balcony? I'll tell you what brought me in off that balcony. Probably at least a minimum of a quarter, million, quarter of a million prayers that had been said for me. I mean, you just start counting it up, how many times you pray, and then when one of your kids get in trouble, how many times, how many times you pray, and how you're now desperate enough to get other people to pray for them. You're desperate enough to tell them, our family is in good shape. We need somebody to pray for us because we're a community, and the gospel community prays for one another. It loves God and it loves his neighbor. And prayer makes a difference. God moves mountains and it doesn't take that much faith, just a grain of a mustard seed. I want to finish strong. There are three phases in life. If you looked at my books, they represent the three phases. The first phase of your life, the first third of your life, childhood, adolescence, teen years, young adult, and the 10 years after high school. In that period, you will be looking for what you're going to, what kind of work you're going to do the rest of your life. You're going to find a spouse and start a family. Now, if you mess up in that part, you'll see what I had to do in the second part. I had to get on another track. I had to turn around. But then the second part, what God usually does is he builds on that. Now you have children. You've got to raise them. You're advancing your career. Guess what? Jesus understands this perfectly. He does? Yes, he does. You know those missing years, 12 to 18, 12 to 31? Where do you think he was? He was in Nazareth. We believe Joseph, everybody does, had died. What is he doing? He's working 12 hours a day, I believe, in the carpenter's shop. Why? He's got four little brothers, at least two sisters, and a mother. He's raising a family. He is working. He, it's his habit to go to the synagogue. His mother said, I'll tell you what happened that period of time. He grew in wisdom and stature and favor with God and man. He was part of a community. And he did what he needed to do to raise a family. He understands that. He understands how busy that is. But now then what you see is the first part prepares you for the second part. The second part prepares you for the third part. And this is where we are, round and third, and headed for home. You've got more time. You've got more wisdom. You know what's important. There are people around you that you can pray for. You can walk through your neighborhood and pray for them. Make sure you know their name so you can call out their name. And here's something I find very interesting in prayer. God reveals himself in his names. He reveals a part of his character. And what I can do is I can match that name, if I know it, to that need. If I have a need, I can call him Jehovah Jireh. Thank you, Abraham, for giving me that. I know you were in need that day. You needed a lamb, and God provided one. He is the God who sees Jehovah Roi. Unusual person gave us that name. She was visited that day by the pre-incarnate Lord. You know who it was? Hagar. She was pregnant now with Ishmael, and Sarah was just giving her a hard time, and she's running away. Two questions he asked her. The Lord, where have you come from? Where are you going? I know where I've come from, and I know where I'm going. I know why I'm here. I know right from wrong, and I know what my destiny is. God has made himself known to me for one reason, for me to make him known to somebody else, to introduce him, and I know his name. He is Almighty God, King of kings, Lord of lords, the undisputed heavyweight champion of the world, has never lost a single battle, never will. My God is the Lion of Judah. He is a roaring with power. He is fighting our battles. And there's no reason for us to back up or back down or let up. I want to be an Earl Tapley. I want to be an African martyr. 
I want to finish strong. He says we're farmers. He says we're soldiers. He says we're athletes. He says we're servants. He says we're vessels. He wants to fill me so that I can empty myself and he sees whoever it is that needs to be whatever I've got to say. Lord, thank you for these precious people. May they realize just how much you love them and just how much you're waiting. You have left them a message, Lord. You have left them a message right there in your word in Jeremiah 33. You have said to each one of us, call me and I'll answer you. You saw cell phones. You saw nobody would answer them. You don't answer that way. You answer us in your word. You said, call me and I will answer you and I will show you great and mighty things. May we do that, Lord. Thank you for this time together. Bring us back again tomorrow. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, Doug. We won't be here tomorrow. Okay. But, uh, I think he's videoing this. Okay. Yeah, so I think you'll be able to catch all of it. Uh, I think that's right. I think, okay. yeah. Uh, Roy? Hey, Roy. Aren't we videoing this so they'll be able to see this sometime? Okay. 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 So if you can't be here, it'll be. Okay. All right.